We are going to continue our series in Malachi. Uh, it's a series about renewal because the message of the book of Malachi is that God wants to renew his relationship with the people. The people who have been in exile in Babylon are coming back to the land that God had promised them, and they're trying to get things established and renewed, and their hearts aren't really in it yet. And so that's part of the message throughout here, throughout this book, is that God wants our hearts. And it started with uh, Malachi chapter 1, with God saying, I have loved you, and Israel saying, how have you loved us? They had forgotten uh, all the ways that God had sustained them and, and kept them through the difficulties that they faced. And they for didn't see that as God's love. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about the, how the priests were accepting inferior uh, sacrifices, animals that were diseased and, and blind and crippled, and, and how they were saying, no, this is my best, but they weren't giving their best. They're giving their leftovers. And that was one more indication that the people were not giving their whole heart to the Lord. And so today, we're going to talk about the priests. And Malachi has a word for the priests. And if you've ever come to church and you felt like whoever was preaching was kind of reading your mail and they're kind of getting in your face, um, you know, th that happens sometimes. It happens to me every time I prepare a message. And this is one of those messages as a pastor that I read and I'm like, okay, Lord, what do I need to change in my heart? Am I honoring your name the way you want me to honor your name? And, uh, and so, you know, maybe sometimes you come to church and, and it feels like the, the pastor's in your face. Well, today, this passage is in my face as well. And these words of, uh, of, of confrontation from the Lord are important to us because they help us to, to see things that we can't really see on our own. If you ever took driver's ed, you probably had uh, your driver's ed instructor challenge you again and again and again to build the good habit of checking your blind spots, right? It's an important thing. My uh, driver's ed instructor, he had this great acronym that helped me remember, MASH, mirror and signal head check, all right? So you check your mirrors, then you signal, then you look where you're going to go, and then you make your lane change, right? That's safety, okay? That's a good way to go about it. But it's so easy sometimes just to be driving along and just, oh yeah, I'm going to be in this lane now, and then just go. And you might be okay every once in a while. But if you're always changing lanes and never checking your blind spots, you're setting yourself up to get hurt someday. And so these words from books like Malachi, they're a way for us to check our blind spots, to check areas in our hearts and our lives that we are not aware, uh, where we are slipping into bad habits or acting in a way that's not honoring the Lord. And so Malachi is going to address the priests so it's going to be in my face as the pastor of this church. It's going to be in our face, though, as well, because in, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus came and laid his life down, and he, he paid the sacrifice for our sin. Sin is something that all of us wrestle with, and Jesus came to make a way for us to, to have relationship with God again. And in this new nation that Jesus formed uh, the, the, of the church, this new people, we all got new job descriptions as well. Because in the past, in the, in the, the Levites were the priests. And there were 12 tribes of Israel all throughout the land. And, and the Levites were scattered throughout the land to serve as representatives of God. To help people understand God's word. To help people understand how to honor the Lord. To lead in worship. The Levites were all throughout. And they were just, it was the family job. But now, as followers of Jesus... The priesthood is not determined by the family job. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this. Peter, writing to the whole church, says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Peter is writing to all believers and saying, You are all priests. Because you are all representing Jesus to the world. Just like the priests in the Old Testament represented God to the people of Israel. Now, all of us are representing Jesus to the world. So we all have something that we can uh, take away from today's message. Because Malachi is not just talking to them, but Malachi is still speaking to us. To challenge us. To say, Lord, how are we representing you? 
Are we living faithfully? And God requires faithfulness from his people. He requires that we trust him with our whole heart, with our whole life. Because we are all priests. I'm going to ask you to take out your Discover card. And throughout the message today, we're going to be interacting with the Discover card for our next steps. And that First Peter passage, First Peter 2, 9, that's going to be our memory verse this week as we think about the calling of the priests, but then also remembering that we are all part of this royal priesthood. So if you want to memorize that passage with us this week, just mark, memorize First Peter 2, 9 on your Discover card. Uh, and we, I want to be praying with you and encouraging you that you will, that will resonate with you. And you'll look for ways to represent the Lord well. So let's jump to Malachi chapter, six, uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Uh, it's on page 669 in the chair Bibles. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, feel free to take that one home, uh, or you can follow along with the Creekside app, however you want to uh, follow along. My hope is that we all take something away from today's message. So let's start in Malachi 2, 1. And now you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not resolved to honor me. Malachi is confronting the priests. He's challenging them to resolve to honor him. And all throughout the Bible, when God raises up prophets, he's challenging them to bring a word of challenge. To bring a word of confrontation. Because he wants to bring transformation in his people. And so he's coming to the priests who are leading in worship. Who are trying to help the people honor the Lord. But the problem here is the priests, their hearts are not in it. They're the ones who are allowing inferior sacrifices. They're the ones who are allowing the people of Israel to, to slip into bad habits. And so the priests are not living faithfully before the Lord. They're not honoring him the way that God has called them to, to live up to their calling, their, their, ex, their, their expectations. So he's challenging them. The challenge is for us is we all have a tendency to drift. It's really easy to say that, no, I'm going to do this thing and then just kind of drift away over time. And that drift might be bad habits. It might be just neglect. It might just be got distracted. But when we recognize that we're not where we want to be, we need to check our blind spots. And that's what Malachi is doing to these priests. They probably didn't even really think about it. They're just going through the motions. And they're, Malachi is saying, check your blind spots. You're not honoring me the way I've called you to honor me. You're not helping the people of Israel live up to the calling of the people of Israel. Check your blind spots. Because if you don't, you're going to get hurt. Now we all, we all need people to help us with this. Because unlike our car, like we, we can't really check our blind spots. Because there are, there are blind spots for us. We don't have mirrors. We can't really do a head check. Like There's things that we just can't see in ourselves because we're just in ourselves. You know, one of the big things that uh, people are talking about is distracted driving, right? And if you were playing Candy Crush on your way in as you were driving here today, that's, that's distracted driving, okay? Um, so that's, that's a dangerous thing. But for followers of Jesus, I think a more dangerous thing is distracted living, because that's where we slip into bad habits is when we get distracted and we get off course because we're following something other than what God's called us to be and do. We start living distracted lives. And we need people to help us speak into our hearts and into our lives. And God has helped us. He's provided for us his word, which confronts us with our, with our hearts and our attitudes and helps us to say like, okay, I know I'm not where I need to be. Lord, help me. And when we pray, we pray to the Lord, help Help me see where I need to be. Help me see what I can do to change. Help, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me to do the change. But the Lord also provides people. People to help us see our blind spots. And, and those people should be people that we trust, that we love. People who are our blind spotters. Now, we, I have these folks because people are watching, watching me, my life and and so I want to make sure that I'm not distracting people from Jesus. So there are people who speak into my life. If my family speaks to me, 
and says, hey, this thing is not right. What you're doing here, watch out. Then I need to listen to them. As pastor, as uh, uh, the elders of our church, they, they have authority to speak into my life. And I know that they love me and they love Creekside and they want to make sure that, that we're all following Jesus together. And our staff and deacons and then friends and family members who, who speak into my heart because these are the people who have relationship with me. Do you have people who are helping you watch your blind spots? Do you have people who are looking out for, for your sake because they love you not because they want dirt on you or they they want to lord it over you but because they love you and they want to make sure that you are are following jesus well and representing jesus well on your discover card there's a place that says blind spotters who are those people in your life it could be friends could be family members could be people from your group that you know but if you're looking at that and you say i don't have anybody who's helping me see my blind spots and recognize them for what they are, then can I challenge you to just write down, I need this? Because you do. You are not meant to do life alone. You need people who can help you on this journey. So who are the people who are looking out for you? I have a a friend, a mentor, uh, who we were talking about uh, something called accountability partners. And that might be something that you, a term you might be familiar with. A blind spotter could be an accountability partner. And he said, you know, I don't really like the term accountability partner because accountants are really just about balance and getting to zero, right? That's where accountability comes from. Like, just, just balance. And, and this, this mentor, he's an editor. He's a writer. And so he's like, you know who I need in my life are editors. People who can see the things that I wrote that are distracting, things that might not be helping. And they can help come through and say, all right, let's move these out and then make what's good great. Because editors want to make you great. They want to help you live up to, to what your potential is telling them you, you can be. And in our lives, our blind spotters are not just people who are just like, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. But they're more like editors who, who come alongside and say, we want you to thrive. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be all that God's called you to be, how can we help? And they speak into our lives because they love us. God's motivation throughout Scripture is his love for his people and his motivation to these priests is because he loves them and he loves his people. But if they don't listen, then the Lord says that he's going to remove their blessing and turn their blessings into a curse. And one of their primary jobs was blessing people. And in Numbers chapter 6, uh, they, they have a specific blessing that they were supposed to say. And, and, and the priests would, would say this with their hands extended like this. Now, if you're a Trekkie, you know, like this is familiar, right? Live long and prosper. Well, Leonard Nimoy is, was a Jewish person and he took this right from the high priestly blessing and said, this is what Spock's going to do. So, That's cool. Um, But the priests would extend their hands like this and they would say this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This was the high priestly blessing. And Malachi is saying, if you don't change your heart, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to take your blessing from you and your blessing will become a curse. Wow, that is intense. Now, this blessing is not just feel good for following the Lord. Because the result in the next verse in in Numbers is that, that, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The, The high priests are reminding the people that the name of the Lord is on them. That they carry the family name. And that's why they can walk in blessing because they're God's children. And the priests who are called to represent God to the people were not representing well. And they're making a disconnect in God's family. And instead of being, having the name of the Lord on them, they were separating the, the people from God because of their disobedience because of their lack 
of awe for the Lord. Now remember, we are all priests. You know, I read this passage as a pastor and I'm like, okay, Lord, you're challenging me. Am I representing you well to Creekside, to the people of our church, to our community? Lord, I need to know. Help me to do this well. But we're all priests. Are we representing the Lord well at work, at home, at school, with our friends, in our community, online? There's all kinds of places where people are watching us because they, they, they know if you're following Jesus, they know that you're supposed to be different somehow. Are we representing the Lord well in the different spheres where people see us? Or are we just like the rest of the world? Are we set apart like the priests of the Old Testament to serve the people, to represent God, and to bless the people? If we're not, then we should ch check our hearts and say, Lord, where, where am I struggling? Ask the, our blind spotters. Help me to see. What am I not seeing? I want to represent Jesus well. The consequence that, uh, I, that Micah or Malachi gives here in the next passage is, is pretty intense. So let's go to verse 3. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. But you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. This is pretty evocative imagery, right? If you don't change, priests, I will smear your face with dung. Now, there are all kinds of jokes that I thought of as I was writing this message that I'm not going to say right now because this is church and it's inappropriate. But I'll let you fill in the blank. That term is biblical, all right? Anyway, figure it out. <laughs> You'll get it on your way home. Oh, that term. Um, we... We see passages like this, where it's like, you're going to smear dung on the priest's face? Gross. Sometimes you read that and you're like, oh, that's gross, and you just keep moving. But the real question we should ask is like, why? Why would you do that? Why does that matter? And so I had to look up. I, I had to figure this out, because there's a junior higher in me that has to know. If there's a poop story, I, I got to know what's going on here. <laughs> and so I, I, had to, I had to know, like, Lord... <laughs> What's happening? Why would they do this? So I, I looked it up. What, what would they do with the dung that was in the animal that they were sacrificing? I had to know. And you know what I found out? They would take it out of the animal before it was burned on the altar. They would take it out of the animal and take it outside of the camp and burn it far away from the altar because it's waste. It doesn't, it's, not up, it's not up to God's standard. He doesn't want it burned with the sacrifice. And what the Lord here is saying to the, to the priests is, if you don't change, you will be waste and you will be removed and set outside of the camp because you're waste, because your heart is not in it. That is, that is convicting to me. And I hope that we would recognize that we don't have to be that way. We don't have to be considered waste. As we honor the Lord with our whole heart, as we serve him and bless others and, and live our lives representing Jesus to the world, we don't have to be waste. But we can honor the Lord. And, and the Lord gives these warnings as an invitation to change. God knows our brokenness. These priests, they all knew they were imperfect people. They, were just had, they had bad habits. They were veering off track. And these warnings in the Bible are invitations to change because God doesn't want to leave us in our brokenness. He wants to lead us to righteousness. He wants to lead us to Jesus so that we can trade our brokenness for Jesus' perfection and to walk with him. They're invitations 
to change. And here, right after t- saying, like, if you don't change, I'm going to smear your face with dung, he gives a picture of what they're supposed to be, what the priests are supposed to be to live in righteousness, to, to honor the Lord, to help the people, to turn others from sin. That's what the priests are supposed to be. Right in the middle of this picture of, like, just this gross picture of what could happen, God gives a picture of what he longs to happen. And his picture of, of the priests is so much greater than what they were doing. And he was inviting them to say, be this way. Walk with me. You don't have to be set apart. You don't have to be burned outside the camp. You don't have to be waste. Will you walk with me? The Lord's warnings are invitations to change. And if you've been a person for any amount of time, you know that change is hard, especially change in your own life. When somebody confronts us, usually our reaction, well, I'll speak for myself. When somebody confronts me, my first reaction is like, I'm not the problem. It's everybody else that's the problem. But we are the problem. Our hearts are so easily distracted from the things of the Lord. Our hearts are so easily drawn towards sin and sinful behavior. That's the problem. And when we try to say, like, I'm going to change, and we try to do it on our own, with our own willpower, how's that working out? How many times have we failed? Because we just try to do it on our own. But true change comes not when we try to change on our own, in our own strength. True change comes when we say, you know what, God, I'm powerless here. I can't do this. I need you. And one of the greatest gifts of grace that the Lord gives to us as we follow after Jesus is that the Holy Spirit is in us. The Spirit is in us and the Spirit empowers us to change. And not try to change in our own strength, but say, Holy Spirit, help me make the right decision. Holy Spirit, help me represent Jesus well. Holy Spirit, help me stop this behavior. Help me stop treating people this way. Help me stop this attitude. Holy Spirit, I can't do it on my own. The Holy Spirit is in us. And the Lord gives us grace to change. So where do you need grace to change? On your Discover card, there's another one of the next steps. It says, I need grace to change. One of the first steps to transformation is recognizing that that we have a problem. Recognizing that that there's something that that needs to be changed in us. And none of us are perfect. We all have areas in our life where we probably are like, you know what, I need God to help me with this because I've been trying and trying and trying and it's just not happening. I'm tired of doing this in my own strength. If you have one of those areas that you were like, Lord, I need help. Would you write it down on your card so we can be praying with you? Praying that the Lord would give you grace to change, that the Holy Spirit would move in your heart and in your life. Because these warnings, they are all sent as invitations to change, to transformation, as we trust the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 7 in Malachi talking about what the priest should do. For the the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and the people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way and by your teaching you have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. What the priest should be doing They're supposed to know the Lord. They're supposed to know the Lord's word and help others understand the Lord's design. But they turned away from that job description. You know, there's times in the prophets where we saw, we see the priests were telling people just what they wanted to hear. They were distracted from the things of God. They weren't honoring him and representing him in all things. It's so easy It's so easy to be distracted. That's one of the reasons why, you know, remembering why we're here 
as a church is important, helping people discover, trust, and love Jesus. We're here to represent Jesus, to help people on the journey of faith to Jesus. One of the reasons why the metaphor of the table has is, is been resonating with, with, with the leadership is because we all have a table. And when we think about our tables, we think, Lord, this is a mission station. How can we help people discover, trust, and love Jesus wherever they're at on that journey as we sit down at the table together? But it's easy to get distracted. And the priests were distracted. But God kept calling them back. He knows what they can be. He knows what the priests could be. And God knows what we can be. Sometimes we, the biggest challenge to transformation is ourselves because we don't think that God has any use for us. We don't think that God has a better picture, a better future for us than, than we can imagine for ourselves. And so we're like, well, you know, this is just who I am. This is a struggle that I'm going to bear. That's a lie. God has a better picture of your future than you could ever imagine. It doesn't mean it's always going to be easy and, and gumdrops and lollipops, but it's better than what you can do on your own. God calls us to trust him, to walk with him, to represent him well. And as we do that, we're going to mess up. We're not going to do it perfectly every time. But God knows that. He knows our brokenness. And that is why he sent Jesus. Jesus came and lived among us. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And when he laid his life down on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. He paid the price for all of our brokenness. And in his brokenness, we are made whole. And when we trust in Jesus, we are trusting in a good, perfect high priest. And the writer of Hebrews says as much in, in Hebrews chapter 4, he says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love that passage so much because it's a reminder to us that yes, every priest, every pastor, every leader, every single person on this earth is weak. We all needed to make sacrifices for ourselves. But Jesus didn't because Jesus had no sin. He was perfect in every way. So when he laid his life down, he was the perfect final sacrifice. He was the perfect high priest in that moment, leading through that whole sacrifice. Jesus wasn't killed. He laid his life down for us. And followers of Jesus, we know we're not perfect. We know our own weaknesses. We also know that we are priests we're representing Jesus. But we're just following after him. And instead of trying to be perfect in our own strength, we say, Lord, when I mess up, I need you. I need your grace. I need to follow after you. And that is one of the most important things that we can do in this world is that when we mess up, we own it and say, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I am just following after Jesus. And he helps me. He is my strength. He provides grace for change. He provides opportunities for me to, to live up to the potential that he has for me. I don't do it on my own. Jesus is worth following. He is worth following every day. Whether you've been following Jesus for your whole life or whether you're new to faith, Jesus is the one that we chase after and we follow after him for all that he has done. And if you're not yet following Jesus, today, today is the best day to say yes to him, to trust him with your whole heart and to say, I, I know that I'm weak. I know that I'm imperfect. And I don't want to do this life alone anymore. Today, if, if you're ready to say yes to the grace that Jesus provides, to say yes to the, the mercy that he provides, will you trust him today?
in a moment, I'm going to pray. And, and while I'm praying, I'm going to ask you just right where you are just to silently pray, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm, I'm believing you today. And if you are making that, that declaration, that prayer today for the first time, then will you let us know on your Discover card where it says become a follower of Jesus Christ? Because we want to encourage you. We want to give you some next steps and help you on this journey. And we're all on this journey together. You are not alone. Will you let us know? Because we want to be able to walk this road with you. Let that the, pray that the Spirit would, would help you to follow Jesus, just like the Spirit helps us to follow Jesus. And join us on the mission of representing Jesus to the world. Yeah, you're not perfect and neither am I. But we're all in this together. We're all following Jesus together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for challenging us. For not just letting us do life on our own. But Lord, you care enough to tell us the truth. And in your word, you challenge us. In conversations with people who care about us, you challenge us. So Lord, help us when we hear people who are trying to look out for our, our blind spots, when we read your word and it, it reveals a blind spot to us. Lord, help us to respond with humility, with grace, and to trust you. And Father, I pray for those who who are saying yes to you today for the first time. Lord, I ask that your spirit would fill them. Lord, help them to know your love, to know your grace. Lord, give them a, a vision of the life that you have for them. And Father, help us all to live up to the life that you have for us. To stop trying to live our own plan, live our own life, our own distracted living. But Lord, help us to follow after you, to honor you in everything, that we will glorify you always. We love you. We worship you today and every day. Amen. Amen.